one of our abiding interests at Idea City is uh, in the subject of and question of design. Uh, over our last two outings, we've heard from Frank Gehry, from Moshe Safdi, uh, Douglas Cardinal, Karim Rashid, his brother uh, Hani Rashid, and today I'm very pleased to uh, present to you a man whose books have influenced my own tastes and opinion in uh, architecture, in design, and in urbanism. Uh, he's Witold Rybczynski. And I bet... <laughs> I bet Witold has had to spell that name almost as often as time. I've had <laughs> to spell Zneimer. So his most recent book is uh, A Natural History of the Screwdriver and the Screw. <laughs> He's an advocate for the nuts and bolts that make the world go, and he thinks that, well, the stuff that I do and many of us do, media, and the so-called information revolution is uh, substantially overrated. We're told. Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you. It's not a plot, but we met for the first time when we were both in the same production at McGill University. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was under Milkwood, Dylan Thomas's uh, incredible and wonderful under Milkwood. Uh, Witold was the assistant stage manager, and I played No Good Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> Moses stole my opening line. I thought he was typecast in that play. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't really meet. I was a first year student, and Moses was already a star, so I was on the, I would see him from afar and admire his work. Let me gather my thoughts after that wonderful playing. I thought it was very canny of Moses to put music with architecture because, of course, they are linked. Uh, Danny Liebeskin started his life as a pianist, and that's not a coincidence. It's, it's in a way, logical. Uh, Goethe said that architecture was frozen music. Uh, I'd rather he said that music was melted architecture, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, there's a connection. There's another connection with architecture, music. Uh, the music we just listened to and the music we heard yesterday uh, is not historical. It's just music. We're not taking part in some sort of historical recreation. We're just listening to music, and the music is as alive today as it ever was. Uh, and architecture is like that. An old building is not a piece of history, or at least it's more than a piece of history. Uh, it's a building. Buildings have long lives. We use them. I live in a house now that's about 100 years old. I lived a long time in a house that I built myself. They're both architecture, and the experience is different, but analogous. Uh, an old building uh, is not a piece of history. We don't dress differently because we live in an old building, but we experience architecture in that building, uh, sometimes the way the maker intended, sometimes not. Uh, but it's just as much a work of architecture. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, an old architect. But you have to understand that an architect at least looks at history uh, not as a historian might, but simply as the world of architecture that came before. Uh, architecture doesn't get better like science does. We've seen science and we can only gasp at the progress that has been made and we we want the latest science. Uh, if we're sick, we want the latest medicine. We're not interested in historical medicine, and doctors don't study the history of medicine in, that, in the same way that architects do. Because for architects, all architecture is a world out there, and it's all in some way the same. Uh, it's all current. And we rediscover things in it, and that, of course, does change it. But the buildings remain, and that's, of course, why preservation is so important, because we never know what we'll need to mine from those individuals from the past. 
I'm only going to show you a couple of slides. Uh, one reason is that this large TV screen kind of intimidates me. Um, Moses is a TV man, I'm a print man, and so uh, seeing these images of people as well as the person at the same time kind of dislocates me. Uh, and so I wanted to, to kind of, I brought these two slides, but I realized they're very good. They can blank out this, uh, this cameraman. Uh, we <laughs> sort of had a long discussion about that, but he was gracious and allowed me not to, uh, not to do what he wanted, but to do what I wanted. Um, one of the odd things about the last 10 years is that we've had all these revolutions. Uh, Moses mentioned the other day the dot-com bubble. One of the, not many good things about the dot-com bubble bursting. Uh, we've all, most people have been hurt by it. Uh, one of the good things is we don't have teenagers telling us about how the world is going to change tomorrow. Um, I appreciate that, no longer being a teenager. Uh, and one of the odd things about the last 10 years is, I think, the absolute uh, power of the word. Um, the computer, after all, is a personal computer is a 20th century device with a 19th century attachment, which is a typewriter keyboard. Uh, and email, and most of what at least I use the internet for, somebody has written. And the power of the written word seems to me is as strong as it ever was. A lot of the people we've been listening to in the last few days write scripts or columns or books or essays. Uh, and that's why we're interested in what they have to say. And that power that was always in the written word is still there and uh, clearly has a long way to go, no matter what these other peripheral changes to the technology uh, occur. I, I'm an architect. I was trained as an architect, and I worked for architects and built architecture on my own. And when I started writing, I didn't write about architecture. I saw writing as an opportunity to go into other fields. And also, I was working on, a, on essentially third world housing, which wasn't a, a sort of an issue that I thought people were that interested in. And in any case, it absorbed me in my university life. It was my day job. And writing was a, a way I could explore other things, other ideas. And it was a great freedom to do that. Um, the work at the university also kept me at the university. It got me tenure and all those hurdles that you pass through. So I didn't have to do that in my writing. I could write about anything. Um, I guess the screwdriver was pushing the envelope a little bit. Uh, but I'm a senior professor now, so I can do that. <laughs> um, so it was rather later that I started writing about architecture. And as many of you know, if you achieve any sort of prominence in our society, you're immediately consulted as an expert on things that you aren't necessarily an expert on. And I had written several books, none of which were about architecture, and then people started asking me questions about architecture, my opinion about architecture, and I remember being taken aback by that, but of course, that didn't stop me from giving my opinion, <laughs> and uh, I, I started writing about architecture for the New York Times in the, in the Sunday section, and then there was, I was asked by a magazine called Wigwag to become their architectural uh, critic and write a column for them, and I did that for the year that this magazine survived. Unfortunately, it got hit by the recession in the mid-80s, and it, it collapsed. Um, but that gave me a, a taste for writing about architecture and situating architecture. Uh, I was never really interested in architectural history, but I was interested in why buildings are the way they are, how we use them, how we live in them, how the public occupies them, and what they actually mean culturally. Uh, to get to this slide, um, I don't know how many people here, I would suspect very few people have seen this in person, and some people may have seen pictures or recognize it, but at the same time, it, it's a very familiar image. Uh, a very large porch, several classical columns, uh, something behind it, uh, a big staircase. Uh, there are, I would venture to guess, millions of buildings like this. Uh, in Canada, there are banks. Uh, I was just sitting outside Osgood Hall, which has a central wing that looks very similar. It's raised up slightly. Uh, Moyes Hall at that unmentioned university uh, to the east. Uh, 
uh, was my first unconscious uh, kind of exposure to essentially this kind of architecture, this, in fact, device. Um, and whether it's the White House or Buckingham Palace, uh, this device of centering a building by putting a porch on it with these, with these classical columns in some variation has spread all over the world. What's significant about this building is this is the first one. This is the Ur building of Western architecture. It all came from here and spread in a really interesting, unusual way all around the world. And we can identify it. I said earlier that architecture doesn't progress, and that I believe that's true. But there are moments and exceptional individuals who are so brilliant and who somehow encapsulate things so well that they sort of throw something into the mix that actually survives. And this individual, and this was a, a villa by Andrea Palladio did, built in the mid-16th century in the 1550s outside Vicenza, north of Venice, uh, is one of those moments. Uh, he didn't actually finish the construction, so he designed it in 1550, the owner died, the things dragged on, uh, so he, in fact, built other buildings before this one, so it's technically not the first building, but it's certainly the first design, and we have his drawings. Uh, it's the first design where an architect has thought, we could do this, we could put this classical temple on the front of essentially a rather pedestrian building, with, with the, which has a clay tile roof, which has a granary at the top floor, those are the little windows. Uh, which has a main, high main floor, and then a basement where we put all the services, the kitchens, the servant quarters, the storage, and so on. So we have this rather functional box, and in front of it we attach this very grand, powerful porch. And that seems like a very simple idea, and it, Palladio lived at the end of the Renaissance, and he came very much towards the end of that revolutionary period. So for a hundred years, uh, architects had been trying to, Italian architects primarily, to combine this classical Roman heritage with the building problems that they had, building churches, in Palladio's case here, a country house, a sort of glorified farmhouse or plantation house. And people had tried all sorts of things. Nobody had had this idea of how you could actually combine it. It's not easy to take architecture from the Romans and then make it practical. And that box behind is essentially a brick box that's plastered. It has a little bit of decoration on it, but it's a, it's a very utilitarian sort of structure. Uh, and by combining those two things, he sort of cut the knot that had been pr so problematic and created a way, a very flexible way, because you can make that box very big, you can make it very small, you can make it as big as Buckingham Palace or as small as the White House. The White House is an interesting story because uh, the first person who, the Englishman who discovered Palladio was a man called Inigo Jones, and he was traveling with his aristocratic patrons in Italy and saw Palladio's architecture and was swept away by it, came back to England and essentially introduced classicism to England. Built about 70 buildings, very few of them have survived. Um, but he was so inventive that he essentially took an idea from Palladio and made it his own. And none of his buildings actually looked like a Palladio building, but they're all clearly indebted to Palladio. A uh, hundred years later, uh, the English rediscovered Inigo Jones, and there was a kind of second renaissance. By now, we're sort of two steps removed. They still went to Italy to see the real thing, but they also had Jones's work to look at. Uh, a German architect called Kassel, or at least he called himself Kassel, I think he was from Kessel, and I don't know what his real name was, but he was a German, he came to England, he picked up on all this and went to Ireland and introduced Palladianism to Ireland. Anybody who's traveled in Ireland knows they have a beautiful collection of Palladian country houses. Uh, about a, a hundred years after that, an Irish architect called James Hoban emigrated to the United States. Uh, became a protege of George Washington and entered the competition for the president's house. And he, for his competition entry, he was young, 
Uh, he essentially adapted Kildare House, which was a building in Ireland, in Dublin, to uh, the House for the President. And that's what we call the White House today. The White House, in fact, was called the President's House. Uh, when the events of 9-11 happened, it was often described as the first act of terrorism on American soil. Well, that's not actually accurate. The first act of terrorism on American soil was committed by the British in the War of 1812. And they sailed up the Potomac uh, to Washington. The Americans evacuated Washington, and the British got out of their boats, burnt the whole city to the ground, got back in their boats and sailed away. Uh, the White House was terribly damaged. They rebuilt it, and then to, to cover up the scorch marks of these terrible fires, they painted it white, and hence the White House, and, and, and subsequently it started being called the White House. But that is how that idea traveled from this little place. This is a very small village. You really have to look for it to find it. It's still a working farm. People still live in the house. Uh, it's telling when you read about uh, houses, say by Frank Lloyd Wright, being restored today after a mere less than 100 years. And here you have a 450-year-old house. And if you go up in the attic, it's the original timber trusses. I mean, they're huge. They're about more than a foot thick, uh, the beams. Uh, it's very well built. One of the things that's so attractive about Palladio when you visit his houses, and you must visit them, he, they are beautiful objects, they're not simply intellectual objects, is that he managed to combine this, these three ideas. He built very well, his houses have lasted well. They, of course, require periodic replastering, but they are essentially what he built. They function well, they're complicated functions. As I said, the upstairs are essentially granaries where they would pile bags of grain. Uh, the downstairs, uh, beautifully laid out. Let me, let's go to the next slide. This is an earlier house of his. I spent a week in this house because I wanted to try to understand. Uh, it's easy to if you read, read the history of architecture, it's clear that he was a very influential architect. That's, anybody finds that out immediately. Uh, I was trying to understand why. Is it simply because he wrote a book and people copied him? Was it because he was so easy to copy? Yet what struck most people was they would visit the houses and it was then that they would have this kind of illumination and say, this is wonderful. And so I thought if I could live in the house for a week, what would I find out about it? Uh, it is wonderful. It's this balance between the beauty of the architecture. This is a very tiny house. It's really four rooms and a central hall. And it's furnished, so the rooms are quite livable today. They, it's furnished in a rather simple way as a living room. On the other hand, on the other side, there's a bedroom and a dining room. And it has extremely tall ceilings, which you immediately get used to. That within a day, they feel natural. An 18-foot ceiling feels right. And about a week later, we went to Venice in a hotel, and I, I felt crushed by the ceilings, because they were only eight feet or something. Uh, it's a wonderful to have such high ceilings, but the, the whole house worked extremely well. So I think the reason that we have things to learn from Palladio is that in many ways he was a very modern architect. He was the first architect to build a career designing houses for people. Uh, these are country houses, not palaces. Um, he did build churches. He did build monumental buildings. Uh, he was a stonemason. He came to architecture not as a painter, which was the common route in the Renaissance, but as a builder. And the reason these houses are so well built is because he really did understand construction. The houses are different. He, he's, uh, Palladio was very famous because he wrote a book, which was a kind of handbook for people who wanted to build themselves a similar house. Uh, what's so striking about visiting his houses is that they're all different. He's an extremely creative architect. He's more like Le Corbusier, who had these phases in his career where he would go in different directions, and who was very, very creative and never pursued an idea for more than two or three projects. And Palladio is like that. There are a couple of houses 
like this, then there are a couple of houses with porches, then there are a couple of houses with two-story porches, then there are a couple of houses with very large porches, and he just simply goes on and on and on. So he never saw this as a system. He's clearly a creative artist. It's also useful to remember that we're much closer to Palladio than he was to the Romans that he was trying to emulate. He lived more than a thousand years after the Roman Empire. We're only 450 years after Palladio. So he is much closer to us than he was to his models. And that's why I think that, and I don't know when this will happen and I don't know exactly how it will happen, but it's hard to imagine that the wheel won't come around at one point and that we'll have another Indigo Jones, another young architect who will travel to Italy, who will see this architecture, and who will be swept away. Thank you very much. Thank you.